While at Semicon 2022 in Taipei, I had the pleasure of attending a series of information sessions on gallium nitride semiconductors hosted by Applied Materials. Gallium nitride, or GAN as it seems to be colloquially called, is a wide band gap semiconductor material with a great deal of potential, most visibly in the power electronic space. The nicest gift that I got at the session, not counting the mountain of brownies that I ate, was a sleek 60 watt GAN power charger. It sits next to my bedside now. For this video, I want to talk about gallium nitride semiconductors. It has arguably become the second most important semiconductor material after silicon itself. GAN sits alongside silicon carbide as the dominant wide band gap materials in the semiconductor industry. I discussed wide band gap materials in my previous video about the latter. Check that one out if you want more detail, but here is a refresher. All materials have a band gap, the energy buffer before their electrons jump out of the valence band into the conduction band. A wide band gap material is referred to as such because their buffer is bigger than silicon. GAN's band gap is 3.49 electron volts, which is higher than silicon carbide's 3.25 electron volts and far higher than silicon's 1.1. It also conducts heat very well. This gives that material high heat and voltage tolerances. Gallium nitride's first and biggest industrial use is as a material for optoelectronics, LEDs, lasers, displays, and the like. Roughly speaking, an LED is made up of a sandwich of two materials. The sandwich sits on a table, which is your substrate. One bread of the sandwich is doped with some other substance so that it can donate electrons, called the n-type layer. The other bread is doped with some other substance to accept those electrons electron holes, and it is called the p-type layer. Where the two breads meet, you have what is called a p-n junction. Apply an electric field to the junction, and the electrons and electron holes recombined, creating light. The light's color corresponds to the band gap of the semiconductor material. Over time, scientists were able to create red and green LEDs, but if we want to create white light or images faithful to the whole color range, we need the blues. The first attempts to produce blue LEDs started with silicon carbide, but silicon carbide comes from silicon, and if you watch the silicon photonics video, then you will know that silicon has an indirect band gap and thus does not emit light. Gallium nitride was a compelling candidate, but first faced a number of challenges. Perhaps the most significant being that people could not produce high-quality GAN crystals on top of a substrate. If it is grown wrong or grown on top of the wrong substrate, then it causes lattice mismatch, which is kind of like when Legos don't fit together. It causes dislocations and cracks. In 1983, a team of scientists at Japan's Electrotechnical Laboratory explored the idea of laying a buffer layer of aluminum nitride between a film of gallium nitride and the sapphire substrate. Another Japanese team in 1986, led by Hiroshi Amano, further explored the idea by growing that aluminum nitride buffer layer in low temperatures. The result was quite nice. In 1991, Shuji Nakamura of the Nichia Corporation replaced the aluminum nitride buffer layer with another layer of gallium nitride, but grown at low temperatures. This worked. Combined with GAN's successful P-doping, this allowed for the invention of the blue LED. An explosion of optoelectronic innovations like white LEDs, lasers, and displays soon followed. For their achievements, Nakamura, Amano, and Isamu Akasaki won the 2014 Nobel Prize for Physics. The story of the blue LED is well covered on YouTube and was a truly world-changing technology. And, just as importantly, it introduced GAN to the semiconductor industry for the first time. As is so often the case, military applications drove the next adoption stage of gallium nitride technologies. Radio frequency semiconductor electronics operate in the microwave and millimeter wave frequencies. They are a critical part of radar, electronic warfare, and communications devices, typically making up nearly 50% of the system's total expense. GAN's thermal stability and electronic properties made it an attractive candidate for the military. They saw an opportunity to overcome limits and improve their equipment. Thus, 
the industry adopted the High Electron Mobility Transistor, or HEMT. Invented back in 1977 in Japan, the HEMT is a transistor you can implement on GAN or one of its alloys to create high power amplifiers with high output and efficiency. A detailed explanation why this is the case I will reserve for a future video on RF integrated circuits in general. But the significant outcome of GAN's entry into the military RF world is the industry adopting HEMT. This would bleed over into the material's next big market, the power electronics industry. Power electronics are an unheralded technology that help control and convert power. Silicon-based power semiconductors have dominated the industry for decades, but silicon's small band gap mean that those electronics have physical properties that limit their density and restrict their ideal performance to low voltage applications, below 600 volts. This opens the door for wide band gap materials like silicon carbide and gallium nitride. The competition between these two materials is subtle. At the start, silicon carbide matured faster than GAN. Silicon carbide is easier to grow. It conducts heat better than gallium nitride, making it far easier to dissipate heat. So, silicon carbide becomes highly advantageous for certain applications. Electric vehicles, rail, windmills, power grids, and so on higher voltage applications above 1,200 volts and the like. An example of such is the Tesla Model 3's silicon carbide-based power inverter introduced in 2018. GAN falls short of silicon carbide for those specific applications, but the emergence of the GAN HEMT gave it one huge advantage. Due to the HEMT's inherent ability to move more electrons, you can make the dyes much smaller. So, for smaller voltage components up to 650 volts or so, GAN components can be made denser and handle higher switching frequencies. So, more power in a smaller package, making it more suitable than silicon carbide. This is important because mobile phones and other consumer electronics are adopting features like larger screens and 5G communications. These features need bigger batteries. The original 2007 Apple iPhone had a 3.5 inch screen and use a 1,400 milliampere per hour battery. Over a decade later, you have the Samsung Galaxy Note 10 Plus, with a 6.8 inch screen and a 4,300 milliampere per hour battery. These batteries need to be charged, pushing up charger sizes from the 5 watt adapter package with the original iPhone to 25 or even 50 watts. If you try to use a weak sauce thing like that original Apple 5 watt charger for these modern phones, then it can take you several hours to fully charge. Consumers are not willing to carry around big power bricks and wait increasingly longer periods to recharge. So on one side you have this new consumer demand meeting a technology that has been waiting for an opportunity like this one. What resulted was a rapid industry transition away from silicon and to GAN. The transition began with 24 to 65 watt GAN based wall chargers from battery and power solutions manufacturers Anchor, Aki, and Rav Power in the second half of 2018. A year later, in the fourth quarter of 2019, the Chinese smartphone brand Oppo adopted GAN with flash charging and their SuperVoc 2.0 adapter. This was the first big milestone, and the tipping point for other phone OEMs like Xiaomi and Realme to pile on as well. Apple does not include a wall charger with their iPhone anymore, but in a final confirmation of the GAN charger transition, the 140 watt charger that comes with their 2021 16 inch MacBook Pro is a GAN charger. The charger was made with components from Canada based GAN Systems, which has a large office here in Taiwan. The GAN wall charger's rapid consumer adoption is probably the most public sign of gallium nitride's rising prominence in the semiconductor industry. It is the thing we are most likely to actually see and hold. The global USB phone charger market is indeed pretty significant. There are 1 to 1.2 billion non-Apple smartphones sold each year. That could push some volume. That being said, I do think more companies will also follow Apple's path in the future and stop including chargers in their boxes, and charger prices will decline over time. All good, because in the coming future, gallium nitride has an opportunity to further eat silicon share in power electronics and chargers for larger items like laptops and home appliances. Data centers too. 40% of a data center's operating costs is power, so every little bit helps. A recent trend has been the use of DC power networks. Without DC slash AC inversion, 
to eliminate power conversion losses and increase efficiency. These require new higher voltage DC-DC power electronics to step up or step down the voltage, which gallium nitride is well suited for. And finally up ahead would be the massive opportunity to supply chargers for the fast growing automotive market. Electric vehicles feature prominently in future market value projections. So it is pretty clear that gallium nitride is an extremely valuable semiconductor and one with an incredible future. But the question that has continually plagued the industry for decades now is, well, can we make enough of this stuff? Going back to the market competition between gallium nitride and silicon carbide, GAN's most consistent drawback has been how hard it is to make. You cannot grow pure crystals of either silicon carbide or gallium nitride using the Trokrowski method. Without this easy method, we cannot leverage baseline standard silicon equipment and practices to our advantage. But silicon carbide's upside compared to gallium nitride is that you can easily grow a nice thick layer of it on top of itself. In other words, you can use silicon carbide as a substrate for silicon carbide. This is called homoepitaxy, epitaxy referring to the process of depositing crystal layers onto something and homo meaning same. Keeping everything the same material simplifies the manufacturing process and reduces the number of lattice mismatch defects. For gallium nitride, homoepitaxy is not easily feasible because making the GAN substrate is hard. Like I mentioned, you cannot grow GAN crystals using the CZ method. Its high melting point, 2000 degrees Celsius, and equilibrium pressure, 60,000 bars, mean that you cannot create a melt to make your crystal. So alternate ways need to be found for creating pure gallium nitride crystals. The ammonothermal method is the most promising. Here you dissolve gallium nitride into ammonia at super high temperatures and pressures so that it grows onto a small sea crystal. The drawback of the method is that it is very complex, the growth rates are rather slow, and it is easy to come out with a defective crystal. With the industry unable to make homo epitaxy work at scale, the next best thing has been to grow layers of GAN on top of a different substance, heteroepitaxy. It is a delicate enterprise. Recall again that for the first blue LEDs we had to grow gallium nitride on top of more gallium nitride on top of substrates of sapphire. Small sapphire substrates are still used to this day for optel electronics. These substrates are small, typically 100 millimeters or so wide, which invalidates scaling benefits. And sapphire is literally a precious gemstone, so using it as a substrate for scaling GAN is generally seen as economically uncompetitive for lower cost electronics products like a USB phone charger. In response, the industry has experimented with a variety of new substrates like silicon and silicon carbide, ironically. There are some proprietary substances like the QST substrate from the Silicon Valley based Koromis company. Japanese wafer giant Shin Etsu recently licensed the QST technology which is claimed to scale up to the 12 inch wafer size. The Taiwan based specialty fab Vanguard Semiconductor, which is a subsidiary of TSMC, seems to be using it a great deal. Solving the epitaxy and manufacturing problem is a key issue to scaling up to larger wafers and bringing down costs. Lower costs will help further push product adoption in the industry. There are many times when the learnings made by one part of the semiconductor industry spill over into others. The same case here. The scaling up of gallium nitride production methods for optoelectronics unlocked new opportunities in other big electronics fields. But it is fascinating to me just how fast the gallium nitride revolutions are permeating through the market. It is interesting to consider how the same technologies inside our blue LEDs also help make better wall chargers for our phones and power electronics for our EVs and data centers. There are probably many more applications up ahead. The gallium nitride industry is still in its early stages and continues to grow. The sky is the limit. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.